Even if you've never read any Arthurian literature before, you probably recognize most, if not all, of the items on this list of what makes Arthurian literature Arthurian, uh, what the story of King Arthur and his knights is. You know that he's the king of Britain. You know that he has a sword called Excalibur that he either pulled out of a stone to, in order to claim his kingship, or he received it from the Lady of the Lake, or both. Uh, you know that there's a wizard named Merlin who helped him do one or both of those sword retrievals. Uh, you know that uh, he becomes king and has his knights sit at a round table. They all abide by a code of chivalry. Uh, he has a queen named Guinevere. He has uh, an enemy and his half-sister, the uh, magician Morgan Le Fay. Uh, his knights go out on quests uh, on their own. They're called Knights Errant. Uh, they include Lancelot, who's probably the most famous, uh, Bedivere, Gawain, or Gawain, Percival, Yvain, or Yvain, uh, Tristan, or Tristram, Galahad, and Kay. All these knights go on a quest for the Holy Grail. Uh, there's an affair between Lancelot, Arthur's best knight, and Guinevere, his queen. Uh, he's betrayed by his illegitimate son, or nephew, or both, Mordred. And uh, after the final battle at Camelon, he's taken to the Isle of Avalon to be healed. All of these elements are present in the 1470 book, uh, Le Mort d'Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory. Mallory was an Englishman, but he, and he was writing in English, but uh, the, the French title of the book gives away that he was dependent on a lot of French sources, uh, for reasons I covered in the last lecture. Uh, so much of the source material during the 1200s and 1300s was being worked on and written in, in France. And these were the sources Mallory used, and uh, all of these elements that we know today as part of King Arthur's story, Mallory was pulling from these French sources. However, as we've learned in the past in this class, when you redact multiple sources, you tend to find doublets. You tend to run into contradictions. The, some of the stories uh, disagree with each other. Some of them agree too much. In other words, there's two versions of the same thing. Uh, we have that sort of situation happen for Mallory with the sword Excalibur. Uh, is Excalibur the sword that Arthur pulls from the stone, or is it the sword he receives from the Lady of the Lake? And Mallory, Mallory seems to be confused. Uh, he refers to both swords as Excalibur at one point. Uh, the movie in the 1970s called Excalibur tried to solve this problem by having Arthur pull Excalibur from the stone, uh, break it in a fight with Lancelot, and then he gave it to the Lady of the Lake who put it back together and gave it back to him. But that's not what's in Mallory. Mallory just gives both versions of the sword. It seems that Mallory maybe didn't intend to make the sword in the stone Excalibur, but he does use the word Excalibur to refer to it one time. So if we go back in literary history and look at Mallory sources and their sources, and maybe even their sources sources, we find in the 1135 work, uh, History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, the, the first sort of really extended version of the story of Arthur. We, have, we see that he has a sword called Caliburnus, and that's the Latin root for the name Excalibur. However, Geoffrey doesn't tell us whether the sword was pulled from the stone or where it came from. The name Caliburnus uh, is the Latin version uh, root of Excalibur, but it also seems to be the Latin version of the Welsh name for a sword called Calid Fulc. And Calid Fulc is what the sword is called in the Mabinogian story of Keelhook and Olwen. And Keelhook and Olwen, even though it's in the Mabinogian with some uh, uh, narratives that were produced at a later date, it probably dates back, the, uh, the work itself uh, dates to around 1100, which is before Geoffrey's time. And it seems to be an iteration of a story that goes back maybe centuries before that. Uh, one of the, the Welsh stories that Welsh bards would uh, tell uh, during the six, seven, eight hundreds. And that sword, Caled Folk, itself seems to resemble the name for an Irish sword, mythological sword, called Caled Bolg, that many early Irish heroes use at one time or another, including Cahulan. But in Geoffrey of Monmouth's narrative of Arthur, we have no explanation of where the sword came from, or what happens to it in the end. In the sword, in the stone story, Arthur has been raised anonymously because Merlin took him after he enabled Uther Pendragon, the former king, to uh, have the woman that he wanted, even though that woman was married to uh, a rival king. Uh, Merlin said that, you know, I'm going to take the child, and he takes him away from Uther because he knows Uther is doomed. Uh, 
he gives the boy to a knight named Ector. Uh, Ector raises him, but Arthur doesn't know who he is, and the whole land is divided among contending kings until uh, a sword appears one day in a stone, and uh, inscribed on it, it says, whoever pulls this sword from this stone, uh, and anvil, there's an anvil in the early versions, um, is rightwise king of all England. So uh, all the nobles try to pull the sword to try to become king. None of them can, but only Arthur can easily. And once uh, the, the others are fighting uh, at a tournament, no one's paying attention to it, he goes and pulls the sword from the stone. Uh, in the other story, the story of the Lady of the Lake, again, Merlin is uh, guiding Arthur. He's his, his mentor. Uh, and he takes him to this lake, which is connected to the uh, other world. Uh, there's you know, something very supernatural about it. A woman lives in the lake, uh, later variously named uh, Nimue or Vivian or some combination of those two. And the Lady of the Lake gives Arthur the sword and a scabbard. And Merlin asks Arthur, which do you think is more valuable, this sword, Excalibur, or the scabbard? And Arthur says, well, of course, the sword, you know, the scabbard is just what you keep it in. And Merlin said, actually, that scabbard will stop your wounds from bleeding. So if you ever get cut, you won't bleed to death. That's, you know, that could save your life more than, uh, more easily than the sword could. Well, these two versions both appear decades, uh, even a century after Geoffrey of Monmouth first gives us that connection of the sword Excalibur with uh, King Arthur. So if we put this on a timeline, so we can sort of figure out uh, how far back our evidence of the sword connected with Arthur goes, uh, we see that uh, the sword in the stone goes back to about uh, 1210. Uh, the sword from the Lady of the Lake goes back to about 1240. The earliest text that tells us Excalibur came from the Lady of the Lake was from the what's called the uh, post-Vulgate cycle, which is a whole series of uh, French works which were based on sometimes other French works which were based on either Welsh or Breton works, uh, often borrowing from Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, sometimes taking from uh, troubadour uh, poetry. And it was in one of these, called Suite de Merlin, that the uh, first narrative iteration of the Lady of the Lake giving Arthur the sword and the scabbard comes. Now, the sword in the stone story whether or not it is Excalibur, uh, the, the earliest version of that is from another work named after Merlin, and this one is by Robert de Boron, writing in the year 1210. And he gives the, the first account of Arthur pulling the sword and proving that he's the rightful king, uh, although in Robert de Boron's version, it's not Excalibur. Everything before that that mentions Excalibur, or some variation on that name, uh, doesn't tell us where the sword came from. It just tells us it's a great sword. And so if we have a sword with this many uh, connections to other stories. Uh, if we have Excalibur uh, in the Latin form of Caliburnus and it's in the uh, Welsh form of Caled Fulc, and both of these come from uh, sources that are uh, heavily dependent on Welsh oral tradition, and it also resembles the name of this Irish sword, uh, that tends to indicate that this probably had a long oral history, this sword. Uh, the thing is, it would have to be a really long oral history to get back to the time of a, a historical King Arthur if the historical King Arthur fought at the Battle of Baden around the year 500. Remember that uh, the Battle of Mount Baden was where the Britons uh, defeated the Saxons and at least for a while stopped the advance of Anglo-Saxons into the island of Britain. That's the time we want to get back to. That's where uh, the references to certain identifiable kings uh, like Ambrosius Aurelianus and identifiable battles uh, that are later associated with Arthur, that's, where, that's when they took place. So if we can get uh, any of these narrative elements back to that point in history, we've got something that will tell us something about a historical King Arthur. But so far with uh, Excalibur, we only get specific references to it uh, starting with the year uh, 1100 and evidence that it probably goes back further, but we can't tell how far. Another story element that seems to be inseparable from Arthurian literature is the ideal of chivalry. Thomas Mallory has Arthur's knights swear what uh, is called the Pentecostal Oath, because they swear it on the Feast of Pentecost. In Mallory's account, uh, every year at the Feast of Pentecost, uh, all the knights had to swear that they would do the things that we today still use to define chivalry. He charged them never to do outrageousity, or never do murder, and always to flee treason, and by no means to be cruel, but to give mercy unto him that asketh for mercy, upon forfeiture of their worship and lordship of King Arthur forevermore. In other words, they lose their honor and they lose whatever lands and titles that King Arthur had given to them. 
and always to do good to ladies, damsels, and gentlewomen, succor upon pain of death. In other words, go out of your way to help women in need. Also that no man take no battles in wrongful quarrel for no law, nor for the world's goods. Uh, so you don't fight in order to take things for your own, uh, for your own greed. You shouldn't be motivated by greed or arrogance. And this seems like a very necessary sort of code for knights to abide by uh, when we're talking about people who are extremely powerful, who have the capacity to do great violence. You don't want to have to worry about them using that violence to hurt those weaker than them or to harass people that have what they want. Uh, and even if you're King Arthur, you need to keep your soldiers in check because they could be a threat to you. They could also be a threat to the people who would then uh, blame you for their behavior. So the Pentecostal Oath establishes, for a very practical reason, uh, the sort of uh, higher order value of chivalry that we associate with Arthurian literature to this day. However, not all Arthurian literature is so chivalrous. Writing in the year 1190, uh, an English writer, this is the, actually the first uh, Arthurian narrative in the English, in modern English. Uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth was uh, British, but he wrote in Latin. Uh, but this uh, writer named Lachemann, uh, it looks like Leamon, and I'll, I'll say Leamon because it's easier than Lachemann, but uh, he's actually translating Geoffrey of Monmouth, but he's adding a lot more material, and we don't know where he got all of this other material. But uh, Leamon's uh, version of Arthur doesn't seem very chivalrous. Uh, multiple times, uh, Arthur is using his military strength for conquest and conquest for its own end. Uh, never mind the weak, never mind helping people that need help, just use force to show that we're the strongest and no one can stop us. And even in sort of fits of rage, when a knight uh, starts a fight in court, uh, Arthur is so uh, aggravated by this that he threatens to not only punish that knight, that knight will be drowned in a nearby swamp, uh, but then he says, take you all his dearest kin that you can find and strike the heads off of them with uh, your broadswords. The women that you find of his nearest kin cut off their noses and let their beauty go to destruction. And I will destroy the whole race that he came from. Uh, in other words, all of his family and all of the people that are of his uh, identity group. And then he says that if anybody else ever does, starts a fight in my court the way this guy does, uh, Nothing's gonna save him. He won't be able to buy his way out of it. And uh, Arthur wants everybody to know how serious he is. So he says, bring me these religious relics and I will swear on them that I will always punish everyone this way uh, for something that we might see as, you know, something that should be restrained, but uh, something that doesn't justify Arthur's lack of restraint, uh, hurting not only the person who uh, started a fight in Arthur's court, but also, you know, killing and mutilating all of his uh, kin and the people that are from his community. Not exactly the chivalrous ideal. Now, this is these aren't the only two representations of chivalry or lack of chivalry, uh, but they show two sort of extremes. And we see literature evolving as ideas about uh, martial valor are evolving uh, in the Middle Ages because knights are such a, a powerful potential threat. That's precisely why culture needs to put some sort of rein on them to uh, keep them in check, keep them from, from turning uh, violent against uh, people who can't defend themselves, uh, keep them from becoming a threat to society. And we do see chivalry being developed in the literature, but it's being developed gradually and it's not always consistent. And that sort of channeling male aggression and sending it out into the world is a theme uh, at the individual level uh, with the, what's called the knight errant. That is a knight who wanders, who goes out in search of adventure. And most of Arthurian literature isn't actually about King Arthur, or at least King Arthur's a background character. It's, uh, most narratives are about one of his knights. That wasn't always the case with Geoffrey of Monmouth and Lyamon and uh, another French author named Wass. Uh, the initial focus was about what Arthur himself did, and that was doing things like conquering Rome and uh, fighting a giant. On the way to Rome, he stops at Mont Saint-Michel, an island off the coast of France, and fights a giant. That's what the picture in the middle depicts. Uh, the picture in the top left uh, has King Arthur standing above the crowns of all of these kingdoms all over Europe that he supposedly conquered. 
most of these earlier works are about Arthur's individual actions, uh, but most of the later works feature him as a background character. And it's some other knight that rides out and in search of adventure, taking his sort of uh, aggression, his potential uh, to do violence and channeling it hopefully for good. He goes out looking for uh, damsels to save or, or injustices to right. And of course, he always finds it. Uh, a narrative without conflict isn't gonna uh, keep, it, uh, keep us interested. And of course, the conflict is usually in the form of another knight or several other knights. Knights who do not show the same level of chivalry. Uh, knights who are looking for a fight just to uh, fight, just to sort of show their own strength. Uh, or knights who are abusing uh, the weaker people around them. It's these knights that Arthur's knights have to seek out, find, and, and beat, and uh, kill them if necessary. But of course, if, if any of the knights that they defeat ask for mercy, they're supposed to give them mercy. But what we're also going to see in some of the literature that we're going to read in this class is that sending knights out uh, helps to keep them from, you know, hanging around the court and end up ending up in fights with each other. But it also is itself a threat to Arthur because as long as his best knights are out uh, on adventures, uh, they're not there protecting Arthur in his court. So that leaves Arthur vulnerable to attacks from the usual enemies, the Saxons, the, uh, the Irish coming across the sea, uh, the Scots and Picts coming down from the north. So there's this balance. Uh, we have to keep you know, most of the knights around Arthur, but then send a few out at a time to go do things to improve uh, the, the, the wider realm. Uh, but we don't want them to stay gone too long, and we don't want too many knights to be gone at one time, uh, because then the kingdom's in jeopardy. Another way to keep the knights from uh, fighting with each other is to keep their egos in check. And you do that by not having a long table where uh, the most important knights sit to the left and right of the king himself, and then every seat further away from the king is a seat of less importance. Uh, instead, Arthur, of course, has the round table where everyone is equal. Everyone can see everyone else. There's not an end of the table. Uh, in some versions, the round table could seat uh, 1,600 knights. Uh, and Lahman tells us this. Um, the Vulgate tradition says more like 200. Robert de Boron says 50. Uh, one of these seats is the Siege Perilous. It's the uh, seat that is uh, set aside for one uh, unnamed knight that is going to be the purest knight, and the most perfect knight, and eventually that uh, is revealed to be Galahad, the son of Lancelot, who eventually wins the Holy Grail in the uh, Vulgate tradition. And with the round table, it just so happens that we have a physical object we can point to and say, there's the round table. And the top right corner, that is the Winchester round table, which was discovered during the Wars of the Roses, and just so happened to have the colors of the House of Tudor uh, painted on it, and so quite conveniently for the Tudors, it pointed to the fact that they were descended from King Arthur. Well, this seems a little too uh, uh, convenient for the, the Tudors who were fighting uh, with other families to prove their uh, claim to the throne after a long and bloody and divisive uh, series of wars. Uh, that's because it is. Uh, the dendrochronology, the uh, counting the rings to see how old the, the tree was, uh, shows that it probably was cut down around the year 1250, between 1250 and 1280. At the earliest, it probably dates back to the reign of Edward I, who was very fond of uh, finding Arthurian uh, artifacts that proved his uh, descent from King Arthur. And not to be outdone, Henry VIII uh, had a picture of King Arthur painted on the table, and it just so happened King Arthur looked pretty much exactly like Henry VIII. So is the round table historical? Well, yes. The thing is, the history it tells us about is the history of the Wars and the Roses and not anything to do with King Arthur. But the uh, story of the round table f first appears in a work called Roman de Brut by the French poet Wass. Roman is, we're gonna see the word Roman in a lot of titles, that's just the French word for novel or story of. And Brut here refers to the legendary founder of Britain named Brutus. But even though Wass is translating Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, he's adding a lot of things, just like Lachemann did. And one of the things he adds is the story about the round table. Because of these lords about his hall, of whom each knight painted himself to be the hardiest champion, and none would count him the least praiseworthy, Arthur made a round table so reputed of the Britons. So Arthur is creating this table so that no one fights over who's more praiseworthy than uh, anyone else. And when they sit down to meet to their dinner, uh, their chairs should be high alike, you know, equally prestigious. 
their service is equally uh, prestigious, equally relevant, and none before or after his comrade. No, no one is before or after, uh, you know, in front of or behind his fellow knight. Thus no man could boast that he was exalted above his fellows, for all alike were gathered round the table, and none was alien at the breaking of Arthur's bread. So the round table that you can still visit, uh, hanging in the Winchester Castle in southern England, uh, unfortunately can't date back beyond around the year 1250. Uh, the story is about 100 years older than that, but it only goes back to around 1155. Another characteristic of Arthurian literature and of the Knights of the Round Table is the ideal of courtly love. The High Middle Ages saw sort of a, a cultural revolution when it came to ideas about love. Uh, for much of the Middle Ages, you, at least if you were in the upper class, you had to marry who your parents chose for you. There were arranged marriages that had more to do with property uh, than they did with actual connection between two people. Uh, we see in the literature, especially French literature, of the High Middle Ages, and by that I mean, you know, the late 1100s, early 1200s, and, and on, uh, this idea that love transgresses the culturally established boundaries of what uh, marriage is supposed to be. And courtly love, in particular, is not just being in love with someone, there's always some sort of conflict to the love. Either the love is unrequited and the lady doesn't love the knight that loves her, uh, or there's a love triangle or uh, frequently involves adultery. Uh, the, the woman that the knight loves is already married, but he can't put her out of his mind and he obsesses over the object of his affection. Uh, the women in these uh, portrayals tend to be pretty passive. It's uh, Even if they're in love with the knight, they don't express it, or they express the opposite. They act as if uh, they didn't want anything to do with him, even if they later admit that they were in love with him the whole time, or something like that. But something is preventing the love from sort of going to the next level and being recognized and being legitimate in the, the cultural terms established uh, for people at this time. Now, even though that term, courtly love, dates back to a work of scholarship in 1883, uh, the idea that it describes, uh, the, the scholar was actually describing uh, the work called Lancelot or the Knight of the Cart from uh, the year 1177 by Chrétien de Troyes. And this is the first sort of Arthurian uh, step into the genre of courtly love. Now, the possible exception to that statement is the story of Tristan, or Tristram. Uh, this seems to have been a, a story on its own that wasn't, uh, Tristan wasn't originally one of King Arthur's knights, but it was such a popular story about uh, this knight who was in love with uh, uh, the wife of his uh, king. And that just uh, was such a popular tale at the time that it seems to have influenced uh, Chrétien's depiction of Lancelot. Uh, in the, uh, his text, The Knight of the Cart. But it was Chrétien de Troyes who really sort of uh, cemented this idea that uh, the best kind of love story is a story where the, the people can't be together, even if they want to be. Now, there were certain conventions to courtly love, uh, almost so formulaic that uh, it was the subject of parody in another one of Chrétien's works, which is Percival, or The Story of the Grail. And in that, uh, Percival, in the very beginning, is this very naive uh, kid who, uh, whose, whose mother raised him away from the rest of society, so he didn't know anything about how high society uh, behaved. So his mother told him that you'll meet a woman that you'll fall in love with, and uh, she'll give you a kiss and a token of her affection, like a ring or something like that, and that's how you'll know that the courtship process has begun. Well, he goes out and the first woman he meets that he uh, thinks is uh, beautiful, uh, he walks up and kisses her and takes her ring uh, without her consent and she's just flabbergasted. So uh, some of these conventions were already in place, were already be being made fun of by 1182 by the same person who really popularized this idea uh, with uh, Arthurian literature. But it's that earlier work, uh, Chrétien's Lancelot or The Knight of the Cart, that has really sort of linked uh, Arthurian literature with this idea, and specifically with the character of Lancelot. Lancelot, uh, frequently called Lancelot du Lac, Lancelot of the Lake, and he goes to Arthur's court and is the best knight. He's the most chivalrous knight, but he's also the most powerful knight. Um, 
and he falls in love with Guinevere, the queen, who's married to Arthur, and they can't be together, but Guinevere loves him, and he loves Guinevere, and uh, in, in Chrétien's accounts, they never actually uh, get together, although the story of their adultery does become a very powerful uh, narrative thread within the uh, French tradition especially, and then eventually with Mallory, it becomes part of one of the foundations of Arthurian literature. But in this story, The Knight of the Cart, we see Lancelot for the first time. This is the first time Lancelot has ever been named in any Arthurian literature or any other literature for that matter. Uh, the title, The Knight of the Cart, comes from an episode in which uh, Lancelot is on his way to rescue Guinevere after she's been captured by a, an evil knight. And he rides all of the horses that he can get a hold of until they die underneath him. He's, he's that obsessed, he's that, uh, in, he's in that much of a hurry to get to her. And he, of course, he's a knight, he's wearing armor, he can't just sprint. So once all the horses he's ridden are dead, uh, his only way to get to where she is is to get on this cart. And this guy comes along with uh, pulling a cart and he says, you know, I'll let you on my cart, but uh, be aware that uh, we use this cart to transport criminals. So people don't just ride around on carts. Uh, if we see somebody on the back of a cart, that means this person is being taken to prison. This is a person of ill repute. Uh, so he hesitates for two steps, but then he eventually gets on the cart. Uh, the, the, the driver takes him to uh, where Guinevere is. Uh, he you know, fights several battles and duels to, to get her back, and she refuses to speak to him. And he can't imagine why she refuses to speak to him. And uh, along the way, everyone sort of says, oh, that's the knight of the cart. That's the, the shameful knight who must have done something horrible, dishonorable to be carried around on the back of that cart. Uh, and we at first think, well, maybe Guinevere thinks that he's done something shameful. Uh, that's why he was on this cart. But uh, it turns out she knew that he hesitated two steps. She's angry at him that he didn't immediately jump on the cart. Uh, she's angry at him for hesitating. So uh, it's almost a, sort of a, a parody before the genre really takes off. But this is our first look at Lancelot. And this one text sort of set the, the paradigm for what a courtly love romance should be. Uh, there should be this uh, knight who's the best of all knights who uh, goes and does the usual things knights do, which is fight battles, but that's still not enough because the, the love that he seeks is one that he can't fully achieve. In later literature, Lancelot and Guinevere actually do sleep together and they do uh, carry on a, a long adulterous affair uh, without Arthur's knowledge, but eventually Arthur's half-sister, Morgan Le Fay, finds out uh, Mordred, Arthur's nephew and possible son, and later combined it to, to be both in, in later literature, finds out and uses this as an excuse to turn uh, King Arthur against Lancelot. And this leads to a battle between uh, Lancelot and his allies and King Arthur and his allies, uh, and the remaining knights of the Round Table who haven't left to side with Lancelot. And it's while they're in France uh, fighting it out with each other that Mordred uh, tries to take over the throne. And uh, when he finds out, Arthur comes back, but it's uh, uh, almost too late. He's, he's able to defeat Mordred, but he's uh, wounded and uh, fatally wounded in the process. So. Uh, what starts out as sort of a simple, sort of lighthearted tale about this knight who really wants to prove himself to the woman that he loves but can't have, uh, turns into the fall of Camelot. But despite being an adulterous affair and despite uh, sort of setting in motion the fall of, of Arthur's Round Table, uh, this uh, this affair uh, in, in particular, and the idea of sort of love triangles and adultery and that sort of thing in this genre of romance is treated very sympathetically. And in fact, in a lot of the literature, it's the ones who actually want to catch them and uh, punish them, or the, the ones who uh, want to put an end to this affair that are shown to be the, the vengeful ones or the jealous ones or, or whatever. It's uh, Lancelot we're intended to sympathize with, even more so than Arthur. Uh, Arthur becomes even more pathetic at this point. You know, Not only his, in later literature does he just sort of remain in the background and not going out uh, like his knights do and going on quests, but now uh, his wife is uh, cheating on him with his uh, you know, greatest knight, his, his greatest ally. But we're meant to think, that well, this is hurting Lancelot too. He doesn't want this situation to be as it is. He can't choose who he falls in love with, uh, but he can't not uh, be preoccupied with her. But before Chrétien's uh, Lancelot, Knight of the Cart narrative, uh, there was no Lancelot. Uh, there was a tradition of uh, Guinevere being an unfaithful queen. 
And Jeffrey of Monmouth mentions that uh, she was uh, notoriously unfaithful to Arthur, but he uh, conspicuously says, I'll say no more about that. Uh, he, he brings it up, but then he drops it. He doesn't go into detail. But in Geoffrey's account, it's after Arthur goes to war with Rome and then comes back that Mordred and Guinevere have gotten together and tried to take the crown, uh, try to take over the throne. So uh, in Geoffrey's version, it's sort of Guinevere plotting along with Mordred uh, to make Mordred the king. Whereas in later accounts, uh, Mordred kidnaps Guinevere, but she's there unwillingly. She'd much rather be with Lancelot. In Lancelot, Knight of the Cart, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, and in later French literature, almost all later literature, uh, including Sir Thomas Mallory, who uh, uses uh, the French literature as his sources. Uh, Lancelot is the greatest knight, and Sir Gawain, uh, or frequently in America pronounced Gawain, but I'm gonna try to stay closer to the Welsh, uh, at least the modern Welsh pronunciation of Gawain. Uh, Sir Gawain is sort of the foil. He's the one who is not as good in combat. He's the one that's uh, not as honorable, not as uh, courtly, not as chivalrous as Sir Lancelot. So he's usually represented as very arrogant and self-righteous and uh, he acts before he thinks. Uh, the thing is, this starts with Chrétien de Troyes' uh, Lancelot Knight of the Cart. And it seems to be Gawain in particular who's chosen to be a foe with Lancelot for two reasons. One is a, a pun on his name in French. In French, it's Gauvin, and the last four letters being V-A-I-N, meaning the same thing in French as they do in English, a vein. So someone who, who looks the part but doesn't have the interior substance. Uh, the irony there being that this character is being portrayed a certain way just because of four letters of his name, a sort of pun. Uh, but the other reason seems to be that he was, before Chrétien was writing, seems to be Arthur's number one champion. Uh, this was the greatest of Arthur's knights, and if you want to introduce a new character, you have to do like the Hollywood movies do. You can't just say, here's, here's my version. You have to say, my version is better than everybody else's that has come before. And that's what Chrétien de Troyes does, and that's what the later French authors do. Of course, as a Frenchman, Chrétien creates a French knight. Uh, Lancelot comes from Brittany. And of course, the French knight is going to be better than the uh, British knights uh, in the eyes of the French author. But with Sir Gawain, we have a character that's clearly much older. Uh, he shows up in the uh, early medieval story of Keelhook and Olwen as one of Arthur's knights, although his name in Welsh is Gwilchamai. He's in Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain as Gwalganus. Uh, he shows up in Dutch and uh, German romances as Wallowain, although if you read these in like the, the Dutch uh, romance of uh, Morian, he's, it's usually translated into Gawain, that's the, you know, the, the English version. Gawain appears in more Arthurian literature than any other of Arthur's knights because he was around before Lancelot, he sort of had a, a head start. But he even shows up in most of the Lancelot narratives as the foil, as the one who's He's one of the best knights, but he's not quite as good as Lancelot. This is just sort of used to show how good Lancelot really is. But by the time we get to Thomas Mallory, he's become almost the worst knight, the, the most arrogant, the most unchivalrous. Uh, and even his own brother, Sir Gareth, who shows up in Morion as Garriott, um, even he is, wants to be a good knight, so he idolizes Lancelot and not his own brother, Gawain. But this whole tradition of uh, Gawain is this sort of uh, vengeful or vain or arrogant or brash or uh, unchivalrous knight. All of this comes from the French tradition, uh, the Vulgate cycle, uh, and that comes from Chrétien's use of Gawain as uh, the not quite as good as Lancelot uh, character. This is the tradition that Mallory picks up in Le Morte d'Artour, and because Mallory's uh, Le Morte d'Artour is the most comprehensive accumulation of Arthurian narratives, that's how that's the representation of Gowan that makes it back into English. Now, if you read Gowan and the Green Knight, you see a very different characterization uh, of the, the same knight. He's very virtuous, very chivalrous, uh, very much the best knight uh, in battle, but also the best knight uh, for his virtue. And this goes all the way back to Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, Geoffrey tells the story of Arthur's uh, invasion of Rome. In that battle, uh, it's Gawain that actually turns the tide. Uh, Gawain leads a counterattack against the Romans, and that's why Arthur's men or uh, that's why Arthur's army is uh, ultimately successful. And that's what you see depicted in the picture to the top right. So, without question, in the earliest literature, Gawain is the most important of Arthur's knights.
in the literature we're going to read in this class, we're going to see that that's uh, still the case, independent of the French tradition. Uh, even uh, in the case of Morian, we have uh, the Dutch uh, translation of the Lancelot Grail cycle, the Vulgate cycle, uh, that is looking at the French source, which uh, does uh, try to portray Gowan negatively. But yet, this Dutch source is going to uh, rehabilitate Gowan, make him back into the formidable and virtuous knight that he once was. We'll also see his prominent role in the marriage of Gowan and Ragnell, uh, where he uh, thinks he's making self-sacrifice in order to uh, benefit Arthur, to, to extract Arthur from a, a very socially difficult situation. Uh, it turns out to be to his benefit, but he didn't know that at the time. So despite his negative treatment in a lot of the, the French narratives and then later in Sir Thomas Mallory, uh, he, is, he does have his own tradition. He does remain the hero in a lot of uh, iterations of Arthurian narrative. And uh, in certain accounts, he's even the one who achieves the, the grail. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering uh, about the three coats of arms at the top of the page, uh, all three of those have been attributed to Sir Gawain. Uh, the one in the middle is probably the most famous because it's described in detail in the poem Gowan and the Green Knight, uh, and it has all sorts of uh, significance that uh, the author of the poem goes on about the, the symbolism of the uh, five points of the pentangle and the red shield. The, uh, for the most part in this class, I'm going to use the one on the right uh, because it's the one that shows up in a lot of the artwork, especially a lot of the later artwork. Uh, you can identify Gowan in the, the Roman battle at the top right because he's got the, the double eagle uh, on his shield and on his uh, horse's trappings. The thing is, these aren't consistent across literature. This is one of the things that varies in, in all the knights. Uh, but I'm just using these in this class to help uh, visually represent the knights we're talking about. Well, if there's one character from Arthurian literature other than Arthur himself and other than his knights uh, that would uh, cause a, a text to seem incomplete without his presence, that is the wizard Merlin. Most versions that we're probably familiar with have Merlin involved early in Arthur's life where he enables uh, Arthur's birth by allowing Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon, to disguise himself as the Duke of Tintagel so that he can sleep with the woman that he is in love with, although he's in disguise. Um, and then after he dies, uh, Merlin takes Arthur to be raised uh, anonymously. And when it's time for Arthur to show his kingship, it's Merlin that takes him to the, the sword, where he pulls the sword and uh, reveals his identity. It takes him to the Lady of the Lake, where he gets the same sword or another sword, depending on the version. And shortly after that, his narrative utility kind of runs out, and so uh, he is uh, seduced by either the Lady of the Lake or Morgan Le Fay or one of his pupils with whom he's in love uh, who demands that uh, if uh, he wants her love then he has to teach her all of his uh, magical abilities. He does this and then she uses this to trap him either in a stone or in a tree or in a tower or several different versions. But Merlin is definitely an interesting character in his own right. Jeffrey Monmouth who gives us the most complete story of the life of Arthur earlier than, than anyone else spends as much if not more time telling about Merlin. In fact, he wrote a whole other work besides History of the Kings of Britain called Vita Merlini, which is uh, the life of Merlin. It's Geoffrey who first tells us the story of when Merlin was a child, uh, he didn't know who his father was, and the implication is he had been fathered by uh, some supernatural father. And when King Vortigern was building a tower to help uh, in his defense against the invading Saxons, uh, the tower kept falling every time his men tried to build it. And Vortigern's magicians told him, if you have the blood of a boy with no father, we can sprinkle that blood on the ground here and that will enable us to build the tower. They overhear that uh, Merlin, who's still a boy, uh, has no father. So they bring him there and they're gonna sacrifice him, but he asks what this is about. Uh, they tell him and he's tells the magicians, you're idiots, you don't know what you're doing, uh, don't you know what's underneath there? Underneath the ground is a, a lake, an underwater pond, and in that lake is a container with two dragons in it, a red one and a white one, and they're fighting with each other, and that's why you can't build their tower. So they dig up the, the two dragons, they find it's exactly uh, as he said, and 
the red dragon eventually defeats the white dragon uh, and then flies away and this is uh, a sign of future events. The white dragon represents the Saxon invaders and the red dragon rep represents the native Welsh and eventually the Welsh are gonna uh, defeat the invaders and uh, be victorious. So a story that involves prophecy and magic seems like the perfect sort of origin story for Merlin. Uh, the only problem is that long before Geoffrey gives us this account about Merlin, the Welsh Annals tells us about a guy named Ambrosius in Latin, in Welsh it's Imrus, who does exactly the same thing. He's the kid that tells the, the story about the red dragon underneath the, the ground where Vortigern is building his tower. And this Imrus, or Ambrosius Aurelianus, we're going to see is an actual historical figure and is mentioned in Arthurian literature very early as a, either a brother of Vortigern or brother of Arthur's father, Uther. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be Merlin. And it seems that in Geoffrey's imagination, uh, Ambrosius and Merlin are the same person. But Merlin is also based on uh, a, a possibly historical figure named Lelokin, uh, who was a a bard from uh, Northern Britain, uh, either Scotland or the very far north of, of England. And even though many people tend to assume that Merlin has some sort of origin as a Druid figure, a Celtic Druid, uh, he's actually associated with, or he's actually called a bard, and of course a bard is someone who travels around singing stories, but bards for centuries before the conversion of the Britons to Christianity, uh, Julius Caesar and, and others confirmed that bards had an almost semi-divine status, just like the Druids did. The Druids were the ones who performed rituals and made laws and that sort of thing, but the bards were the ones who were the, the knowledge keepers. They were the ones who could remember the past because they could remember the stories, and uh, potentially they were the ones who could see into the future. Uh, and this bard, Lelokin, was at the Battle of Arfdareth, and uh, his allies lost the battle. He seems to have blamed himself and gone mad and went to live out in the woods as a, as a wild man. Uh, and it was at this time that he got the gift of prophecy. Uh, this figure of Lilokin later merges with the name Myrthen, which seems to come from the Welsh city of Carmyrthen, or Carmarthen uh, as it's pronounced today. And it seems to be a back formation where somebody uh, said, well, Ker is the name for like a fortress. And so that's Ker Myrthen is the fortress of Myrthen. So this must be the founder of this city. Well, these two sort of names merge into the same character. And it's this Myrthen that Geoffrey is writing about. The problem is he's writing in Latin. And if you translate Myrthen into its Latin equivalent, it would be Myrden. And to a Norman French speaker, it sounds like you're saying this is Shitty the Bard. So he chooses the more you know, elegant name, Merlin, uh, that rolls off the tongue a little bit better. So Geoffrey develops this character, combines lots of different narrative threads into this one character, and has him uh, having the gift of prophecy, but also has him uh, directing and sort of mentoring King Arthur, uh, but also sort of seems to acknowledge that he lived much longer than a normal human lifespan. He also has him uh, building Stonehenge as a uh, battlefield marker. Uh, Geoffrey implies that uh, Merlin's parentage is uh, supernatural on his father's side, but he doesn't go much further than that. Later, Robert de Boron, his tale of Merlin, uh, develops the story to have uh, Merlin's mother is a, a nun who is uh, raped in the night by a demon, an incubus. And this was part of a demonic plan to have a sort of antichrist on earth that would uh, do the devil's bidding. Uh, the thing is Merlin uh, turned on them and he uh, retained his sort of evil magical powers, but he used them for good instead of evil. And again, that starts with Robert de Boron uh, around the year 1200. Later traditions uh, like the Vulgate cycle uh, introduce the uh, narrative about him being uh, seduced by Nimue or Vivian or, or the Lady of the Lake or uh, all of the above, uh, using his own magic against him to entrap him. But uh, that comes much later and it uh, doesn't coincide with the idea that he lives long after uh, the fall of, of King Arthur. So it appears that one of the reasons that uh, Merlin is such an interesting character is because he was uh, developed so many times by so many authors, but he also seems to have evolved from so many different characters from so many different narratives. Another element of Arthurian mythology which seems to be just as integral as Merlin to the mythos, and yet has been through probably just as many changes, 
is the Holy Grail. Now, as we understand it today, the Holy Grail is the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper and in which Joseph of Arimathea uh, caught his blood when he was on the cross. And the tradition holds that Joseph of Arimathea uh, brought that cup as well as the lance that uh, pierced Jesus' side uh, and the platter that was used at the Last Supper brought all three of those items to England where it was kept at a chapel that Arthur's knights eventually had to go and find. But it remained hidden. All these items remained hidden until the grail appeared to Arthur and his knights at the round table. And Arthur's knights uh, all went off after that uh, sort of miraculous uh, appearance, uh, went off on a quest in order to find it and recover it and bring it back. But only the purest of all Arthur's knights could find it, and that is Sir Galahad, the son of Lancelot. Now, if you're scratching your head because you don't remember anything about the Holy Grail in the Bible, uh, even reading about the Last Supper, there's no mention of specifically what kind of cup he used and what happened to it after that. Well, that's because it's not a biblical story. The Grail, as it's described in Arthurian literature, dates back only to uh, the Percival, or the story of the Grail, by Chrétien de Troyes, uh, the same author who introduced Lancelot. Chrétien's Le Comte de Grail, the story of the Grail, in 1182, is the first text to mention the Grail. And it's not described as the Holy Grail. It's just a grail. It has no origin story. The young knight Sir Percival uh, comes upon this sort of otherworldly castle. And he, there's a wounded king there called the Fisher King. And while he's talking with the Fisher King, he sees this procession of these three objects. A lance, a platter, and a grail. And he doesn't ask what these things are. And... Uh, Earlier in the narrative, uh, Percival had asked all sorts of questions because he didn't know anything about knighthood and uh, courtly society. And he'd been embarrassed for asking these questions by people who mocked him for not knowing the answers. So he's sort of given up his curiosity or he's suppressed it. And it becomes a great tragedy because he finds out afterwards, after he's uh, sort of wakes up the next morning in a forest with no castle around, uh, he finds out that if he had only asked who did the Grail serve, then he would have healed the Fisher King's wound and ended the sort of curse that was put on the castle and all the people there. After this event, he uh, tells Arthur's knights about what he's seen and he vies to go find that uh, Grail and find that castle again and, and, and ask this time so that he can heal the king. Uh, we don't know if he's successful because Chrétien didn't finish the story, so that leaves it uh, well open for speculation. It wasn't until Robert de Boron picked up the story and his uh, History of the Grail and uh, another story called uh, Perlisfals, uh, or Percival, around the year 1200. That's when the Grail becomes the Holy Grail. That's when the Grail becomes the Cup of Christ. It's Robert de Boron that has Joseph of Arimathea come to uh, Britain. There's no uh, apparent source material for this. Uh, just like in his Merlin text, Robert de Boron takes a material that uh, has been in oral tradition, or it comes from Chrétien, or, or maybe both, and he puts a distinctly uh, religious interpretation to everything. So Merlin is no longer just a prophet, he's someone uh, who must have been, you know, because Robert de Boron and, and Christians at the time refused to see uh, pre-Christian Celtic mythology or, you know, supernatural beliefs as anything other than devil worship. So that meant that if Merlin is a magician, he had to be, you know, connected to the devil. So that's when Robert de Boron uh, creates the story that uh, he was part of a demonic plan, but he uh, sort of chose to, to do the right thing instead, rejected and turned away from the devil, converted. Uh, similarly, the, the grail couldn't just be some sort of magic vessel that keeps uh, this person alive. Uh, it, it can't be of significance unless it's this very religious object that's connected directly to God or to Jesus. And the way both he and Chrétien describe the grail itself is kind of vague as far as what the object looks like. We typically have a concept of this chalice because that ends up being how it's represented in later art. But if you'll notice the picture in the, uh, the picture on the left side, it just looks like this sort of uh, soup bowl uh, that uh, Joseph is using to uh, catch Christ's blood. And that's originally what grail meant. It wasn't a platter, but it wasn't a cup. It was sort of a, a bowl or 
And after Robert de Moron, it's in the Vulgate cycle, in the prose Lancelot, that Galahad is introduced. The character of Galahad is, is new at this point. He's the son of Lancelot, and he's pure of, uh, of mind, pure of body, specifically sexually pure. And of course, in a tradition that is uh, frequently being written down by monks like Robert de Boron, uh, people who have taken vows of chastity, well, of course, the, uh, the highest virtue is, is chastity. So Galahad is the most chaste of all the knights. Uh, so he's the one that is sort of the, the purest, and he's the only one that gets to actually achieve the grail. In this later version, Percival is also a virgin, but he has lusted, whereas Galahad has never even been tempted uh, to, to sexual sin. So Percival doesn't actually achieve the grail. And of course, Lancelot, despite being the best of all the knights uh, in combat and in chivalry and that sort of thing, uh, he has uh, had an affair with Guinevere, so he's uh, ruled out. He, he gets to see the Grail uh, at a distance, but he doesn't actually get to uh, find the Grail castle like Galahad and Percival do. But like Merlin, uh, there seems to be some connection to uh, beliefs of a pre-Christian world that uh, Robert de Boron and, and other authors had to really uh, reinterpret to, to give religious significance to. If we look further back in Arthurian literature, we can look to Keelhook and Olwen around 1100, in which uh, one of the quests that uh, King Arthur goes on is a quest to obtain a magic cauldron that uh, uh, serves uh, unlimited food uh, to whoever possesses it. And that's certainly not the only uh, Celtic story about a magic cauldron. In the Irish book, the Labor of Gabala Erin, uh, the Book of Invasions of Ireland, uh, we get the story of the uh, Irish gods, the Tuatha de Danann, and the head of that uh, family of gods is called the Dagda, or the good god. And he has uh, two magical objects. One is a club that can uh, kill people at one end and uh, bring them back to life at the other end. And uh, the other thing is this magic cauldron that uh, uh, never runs dry. The Dagda seems to be the Irish version of the continental god Sukellus that has uh, a club or a, a hammer in one hand and this bowl in the other, a bowl of uh, sort of everlasting rejuvenation. And across the Celtic world and even on the, the borders and outside the Celtic world, we find Celtic objects uh, like this uh, cauldron. This is uh, called the Gundestrip cauldron. It's from uh, the uh, location of Gundestrip and the, the northern tip of Denmark which is uh, primarily like Norse cultural area, but we find this uh, uh, cauldron uh, thrown into a bog and it, the, the designs are uh, very clearly Celtic, although it was actually made in Thrace, which is uh, almost down to Greece, but in an area that was uh, settled by Celts for you know most of the Iron Age. And the reason it was thrown into a bog is uh, same reason we find a lot of Celtic objects across Europe, down in the bottom of lakes and that sort of thing, where they seem to be thrown for sacrifices. Uh, and these are really ornate objects, really wealthy, you know, signs of wealth that uh, people aren't just sort of losing, uh, but they're actually throwing them down into these lakes. And this is uh, very likely the origin of our, our current custom of throwing uh, money into fountains, especially coins. A version of this god, the Dagda, is actually portrayed on the Gundestrip cauldron in this image that shows these warriors walking toward him and being dipped into this cauldron and then riding away on horseback. Presumably, uh, you know, this sort of procession of warriors in life eventually go to the other world and they are given the sort of new life after being, not just getting a, a sip from the cauldron, but actually being dipped head first uh, into this cauldron. So whatever its origin, uh, the, the Holy Grail, or at least uh, cauldrons that uh, warriors went in quest of, uh, that could give them you know, better health or everlasting life or whatever, goes way, way back in uh, Celtic oral tradition. And it shows up here and there in the, the literature that we have. But of course, we get a very clear change in the narrative in Chrétien's Percival, or the story of the Grail. Uh, but then it's still just a grail. It has magical properties, it's part of a, a ritual, and, and it's actually used for communion, but there's no indication it's the cup of Christ, there's no indication that the lance is the holy lance, uh, and that sort of thing. It's only with Robert de Boron that we have this deliberate uh, recrafting of a secular and potentially mythological uh, tale that is recrafted into uh, a very uh, symbolic uh, Christian 
uh, allegory. Uh, and of course it doesn't end there. There's going to be different variations on the grail. Uh, some coming very quickly in uh, 1210, Wolfram von Eschenbach, a German, uh, has a very uh, global uh, narrative about the grail. So Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parsifal uh, has a sort of uh, very international scope. There are uh, Muslims there, there are uh, people from the Middle East, there are people from India that are all part of this brotherhood of the grail. Uh, the thing is the grail isn't uh, a cup or a chalice or a bowl at all, it's a stone. Now, the one thing it seems to have in common with the grail is it's something you have to go in quest of. And that's why we use the phrase, the holy grail of something to indicate there's this one thing everybody in this domain is uh, trying to find. The one thing that would, would change the world if we uh, only had access to it. And in that sense, that's the way it functions in all of Arthurian literature. It's not so much what the grail itself does or where it comes from or what it's composed of. It's the fact that it's something to go in quest uh, after. It is an object of the quest. So it may not surprise us that some of the more fanciful elements of Arthurian literature uh, have a particular sort of point of origin. Merlin, Excalibur, the Holy Grail, uh, the Round Table, these things uh, we may not expect to have sort of historical ties. But we still wonder, we still want to find uh, what is the, where did the core come from? Uh, who was Arthur himself? Where was Camelot? And when and where and why did uh, something happened that set these stories into motion. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture.